agencies that may be external that you don't control. According to the Department of Energy, there are only about 160 operational microgrid installations around the U.S. That number, though, is expected to boom in the coming years, largely in part due to major investments by the U.S. included in the Inflation Reduction Act, billions of dollars to expand the use of microgrids, and major tax credits for manufacturers. If you go back to the 1929, you could always help your neighbor out by bringing them a quart of wood or you know, a gallon of kerosene. But you could never bring them a gallon of electrons, right? You can't bring them electricity. Microgrids now making that a possibility. In Tampa, Florida, a first of its kind neighborhood is looking to prove those neighborly benefits in partnership with the local utility company. 37 homes, all equipped with solar panels and energy storage, working together to feed a microgrid. Michelle Johnson recently moved into one of them. They said, you'll be on the microgrid. And I said, what is a microgrid? The whole process is, is simply a solar panel that can convert the energy from the sun into electrons and an energy processor like the Block Energy Block Box here that can take that energy, send it to your home, send it to a battery, share it with your neighbors, share it with the grid in a way that's efficient and effective. The recent Hurricane Ian testing the resilience of this system. It was no issue at all. We didn't lose any power. We felt very secure being here with the microgrids and the solar panels. We had neighbors down the street who did not have this system and they did lose power. Now, she says it's something she can't live without. Would never move into a home that does not have it. I would look around for it, yes. Because it's safety and security. It's common sense to me. In August, President Biden signed a bill into law that included more than $375 billion to fight climate change over the next decade. It's the federal government's biggest investment ever to fight what the EPA administrator calls a climate crisis. We recently sat down with him to talk about turning that legislation into results and whether the parties can find common ground when Republicans take over the House in January. When it comes to the climate, what is the most urgent threat facing the United States today? I think this country is seeing the full breadth of the threats from climate change and the climate crisis. And that's why the president has deemed this uh, an area of focus that we are laser focused on. Every single cabinet is focused on climate change and the impacts of climate change. $370 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act alone to combat climate change. When how and where will Americans see that money put to use? They'll see a reduction in their energy bills because of the push forward in technologies that will reduce the climate change impacts while leveraging tax credits. Americans will see lower costs on electric vehicles and you're gonna see jobs created and you're gonna see America really thrive on the global stage. When you see what happened in Jackson with residents, primarily people of color, not having access to safe drinking water, it's not the first time this has happened uh, in the United States of America. How do you understand what's happening there and why it continues to happen? Well, you know, we've seen these systemic failures all over the country. And unfortunately, they are our communities of color, our black and brown communities, our tribal communities, low income communities. Some of our poorest communities we see have uh, faced indifference, uh, a lack of investment in infrastructure. And so that's why the bipartisan infrastructure uh, law is so important. $50 billion uh, given to EPA to focus on investing in water infrastructure all over this country, and more than 50% of those resources will go specifically to the disadvantaged communities that have faced these troubles for far too long. You and the EPA have tight emission standards uh, on automobiles, and by 2026, it's uh, gonna be 40 miles per gallon, if I'm not mistaken. First of all, is that feasible, number one? And number two, what will the results be uh, if indeed uh, those standards are met? You know, we, we, we know that they are feasible uh, because our technology standards are designed uh, based on cost benefits and feasibility. So we believe that not only will this country <clears throat> hit those targets, but could potentially exceed those targets. You'll see ex record levels of carbon pollution reduced to reduce global warming. Obviously, you can't reduce emission standards without uh, the support of the private sector and the automobile uh, industry. Do you anticipate that as you go for, forward beyond 2026, 2027, 2028, uh, the automobile companies are going to stay with you? I do. And, and as I'm having conversations uh, with the private sector, uh, there is a lot of capital on the sideline that now has the confidence to come off of the sideline because of the massive investments you're seeing from the federal government. We are 
having a good conversation about real, true public-private partnerships that create jobs and keep this country globally competitive. Come January, uh, the Democrats are not going to control the House of Representatives. What type of meaningful legislative action uh, can be taken uh, during the next Congress in order to protect the climate? You know, I'm excited to say that we have a lot of meaningful legislation that has happened over the past two years, and now we need to implement and execute on these billions of dollars that we've been given to help restore communities, to help fight the climate crisis. And so we're excited about the legislation that has occurred. I believe, uh, and, and this president has proven, uh, that he has the ability to work across the aisle. What can you get done? What are your goals for the next two years of the Biden administration? You know, my goals are to really focus on continuing the great work we've done to reduce these pollutants that are causing or exacerbating climate change. Uh, we have already tackled hydrofluorocarbons, highly potent greenhouse gas emission, going to reduce that by 85%. Uh, percent. Uh, methane emissions, we're tackling that from the oil and gas sector. We're targeting 87% reductions by 2005 levels. But then we also have another set of technology standards focused on cars and trucks. And finally, we're gonna uh, push a regulation and technology standards that focus on the power sector, our coal plants and our you know, oil and gas sector and natural gas sector. There's been a big effort to shut down these uh, coal-fired super polluting, so-called super polluting uh, power plants. How much longer are those types of plants gonna remain open in the United States? You know, the, the market has been acting for the past you know, decade, um, looking at what technologies are more suitable in this country to generate energy. Up next, harnessing